Hello, this is Mr. Wong and welcome to Wong Wong Bio, your source for everything you need to get an A in Mr. Wong's class. And today we are going to look into the chemistry that is central to the study of life. And by the end of the video, you will be able to understand matter, compound, structure of atoms, the bond between atoms, and the chemical reactions that make or break the bond. So, to understand how living things work, we first have to understand how the things that make up living things work. Living organisms are made of matter, which is anything that takes up space and has mass. Matter is made up of elements, which is a substance that cannot be broken down to other substances by chemical reactions. If we review our periodic table, each letter symbol represents on the periodic table represents an element. Some of the examples of elements you are familiar with are oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen. These are actually important for an organism to live a healthy life, and we call these elements essential elements. About 96% of the human body is made of the four essential elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. If the elements are only needed in very small amounts of quantity but are still important for the living organisms, we call these elements trace elements. Examples of trace elements are iron and iodine. Each element consists of unique atoms, which is the smallest unit of matter that still retains the properties of an element. So, element carbon is made up of only carbon atoms, and element oxygen is only made up of oxygen atoms. If we break an atom apart into subatomic particles, these subatomic particles will no longer have the properties of an element. Subatomic particles are like the building block that makes up the atom, and the three main types of subatomic particles are neutrons, protons, and electrons. Each proton starts with a letter P is positively charged, while each electron is negatively charged. Each neutron, which rhymes with the word neutral, is neutral in charge. Neutrons and protons are concentrated tightly in the atomic nucleus, which is located at the center of an atom. The nucleus is positively charged because protons is positively charged. The electrons form a cloud of negative charge around the nucleus. Commonly, we will use an orbit model to represent electron circling around the nucleus, like cloud. Each neutron and each proton are almost identical in mass, which is about one Dalton, or atomic mass unit, or short AMU, atomic mass unit. The mass of an electron is very small as compared to the proton or neutron, so we typically ignore the mass of electrons while calculating the mass of an atom. For every unique element, all atoms of that particular element will have the same number of protons in their nuclei. This number of protons is also known as the element's atomic number. A carbon has a number of 6 as its atomic number, which means that it is the 6th element in the periodic table, and it has 6 protons. An atom is also by definition neutral in charge, net charge equals to zero, unless stated otherwise, so a carbon atom that has 6 protons must also have 6 electrons. An atom's mass number is the sum of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. So if a carbon has a mass of 14, the carbon atom itself has a proton of 6, this atom must have 8 neutrons in the nucleus, and we call this carbon-14. Each element is made up of the same type of atoms with the same number of protons, but they don't always have the same number of neutrons in the nucleus. Some carbon atoms could have 6 neutrons, other carbon atoms could have 7 or 8 neutrons. And we call these carbon atoms isotopes of carbon. They are all carbons, but their number of neutrons differ. As you can see here, isotope carbon-14 that has 8 neutrons is heavier than the carbon-12 because this carbon have less neutrons and therefore less mass. Also, carbon-12 and carbon-13 are stable isotopes in nature, so these carbon atoms do not lose protons or neutrons from their nuclei 
via decay in nature. The isotope of carbon-14 is radioactive or unstable in its nucleus, so the nucleus will decay spontaneously or losing protons and neutrons on its own in nature. This radioactive property is very useful in medicine and biological research which we will see very often in later parts of the course. When two atoms come close and interact with each other, their protons and neutrons don't move around between nucleus, but their electrons can move around, and as a result, a chemical reaction can happen. Now, here is the idea. Each atom's electrons carries different amounts of energy, which is the ability to cause change by doing work. Electrons are found in different levels of shells. The further the shells away from the nucleus, the higher the amount of energy in the electron. So if an electron gets more energy or excited, right, it will go to a higher energy level. And when electron loses electron, it will fall back to the shell closer to the neutrons. The chemical behavior really depends on the number of electrons in its outermost shell or valence shell and the electrons located in the valence shell is also known as the valence electrons. Elements with the same number of valence electrons will show similar chemical behavior. For example, all the elements in group 17 have 7 valence electrons, and they all can react with sodium to form a compound. A compound is a substance consisting of two or more different elements combined in a fixed ratio. For example, sodium chloride or the table salt is a compound made up of sodium and chlorine in a 1 to 1 ratio. When the atom's valence shell are not filled with electrons, the atoms will interact with each other in order to complete the valence shell with electrons, either by transferring electrons from one atom to another atom or by sharing electrons. As a result, these atoms will stay close together held by strong attraction called chemical bonds. Movement of electrons depends on the atom's electronegativity, which is the ability to attract electron to its own shell. An ionic bond can happen if electron transfers from an atom with very low electronegativity to an atom with very high electronegativity. If an atom loses or gains electron, it will have an unequal number of protons and electrons, which makes it into a charged atom called ion. An atom that loses electron will be a positively charged ion, also known as cation. If an atom gains electron, it will be a negatively charged atom, also known as anion. Because cation, which is positively charged, and anion, which is negatively charged, are of opposite charge, they will attract each other, and this attraction is called ionic bond. The compounds formed by ionic bond are called ionic compounds. Covalent bond is formed when atoms can share their valence electrons with another atom to complete their valence shells, thus forming a molecule. For example, two hydrogen atoms can come close together to form a hydrogen molecule by sharing one pair of electrons in between them. This is what we call a single bond, which is usually represented with a line between two elements symbol. We can also have two oxygen atoms forming into an oxygen molecule by sharing two pairs of electrons, also known as a double bond, which is represented with two lines between two elements symbol. If three pairs of electrons are shared, then it is a triple bond. A nonpolar covalent bond is formed if two atoms are sharing their electrons equally due to similar electronegativity. Because the electron is right in the middle and neither of these atoms gets more of this electron. But if the electrons are shared unequally because of a difference in electronegativity between the two atoms, the more electronegative atom will get to attract the electrons more so than the other atom, leading to its side of the molecule to be partial negative charge and the another partial positive charge. This unequal sharing of electron due to the polar covalent bond will usually lead to a molecule that's polar, which means the molecule has opposite charge on its end. For instance, 
water molecule due to the blue polar covalent bonds attracting the electrons to the electronegative oxygen, the overall water molecule has a partial negative charge at its oxygen end and a partial positive charge at the hydrogen end. When a hydrogen atom is sharing electron unequally with a very electronegative atom such as oxygen or nitrogen, the hydrogen will be partial positive charge. This partial positive charge of hydrogen allows it to form an attraction to another polar molecule that has a partial negative charge. And thus, the two molecules come closer because of the opposite partial charge. Notice that this attraction doesn't involve in the movement of electrons directly and we call this attraction hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond plays many important roles that we will go over throughout the whole course. What if the molecules are not polar? Attraction can still form. This is because electrons are not always evenly distributed in the molecule and will move randomly by chance. This will lead to random and spontaneous positive and negative charge of the molecule. These charges enable the atoms and molecules to attract weakly to one another. And we call this weak interaction van der Waals interaction. So the ionic bond and covalent bond are what we call the chemical bonds because they involve in the movement of electrons directly. The making and breaking of these chemical bonds through the process of chemical reaction can lead to changes in the composition of matter. For instance, when carbon dioxide reacts with water, the atoms of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen can rearrange themselves through this breaking and making of new covalent bond, thus forming glucose and oxygen. The starting material are what we call reactants, and the resulting materials are products. During a chemical reaction, matter is conserved. It means that reactions cannot create or destroy atoms, but can only rearrange the electrons among them by breaking and forming new chemical bonds. All chemical reactions are theoretically reversible, with the products become the reactant and the reactant becomes the products in the reverse reaction. And we usually use two opposite headed arrows to indicate that the reactions are reversible. There are many factors that can influence the rate of reaction or how fast the reactant becomes the product. One of the factors is the concentration of the reactants. As we have more reactants molecules, they will collide with one another more frequently and thus forming more products. As we have more products molecules, the product molecules will collide with one another and thus forming more reactants in the reverse direction. Eventually, the rates of forward reaction and reverse reaction are going to be happening at the same rate. Thus, no significant change happen at the concentration of reactants and products and the ratio of products to reactants stays about the same and this is what we call chemical equilibrium and that's about it knowing the chemistry knowledge of atom chemical bonds attraction and reaction is important for us to answer the fundamental question how on earth no pun intended does life depend on the chemistry of water just like chemistry supports our understanding of water, your subscription, like, and comments supports me to be a better teacher. See you next time.